All right, good morning, everybody. So let's review what we talked about last time. So what were we talking about? Making LDA. Well, we did talk about that, but what's the what was the general theme? Enolates and enols, enols and enolates. Okay. So if we take something like a ketone, what's the pKa of those alpha hydrogens approximately? Yeah, it's around 20, right? pKa here is around 20. And so if I'm going to try to convert this into an enolate, right? Uh, I'm going to need a base, right? What's the pKa range for the base that I need to make that reaction go completely to the right? So if I want this not to be an equilibrium and come back, I want this to lie completely to the right. What pKa range for a base am I going to need? Pardon? Yeah, somewhere around 35 to 40. So I need a base that has a pKa range. I'm going to expand it just a little bit, but somewhere between 30 and 40. And so we talked about several bases that could fit this range, right? And what were those bases? LDA was one. LDA has that range, lithium diisopropyl amide, right? It has a pKa of around 40. There was another base that we talked about, sodium hydride. Sodium hydride also can do this because it has a pKa range of about 35, right? So those bases are strong enough to push the reaction to the right. And so we would not set up an equilibrium under these situations, OK? And so we learned that this is going to be an important concept for us because having these enolates now allows us to make new molecules by reacting electrophiles with the enolates. Which atom of the enolate typically undergoes the reaction, the alpha carbon or the oxygen? the alpha carbon. It's typically this resonance structure that goes on to produce some sort of bond with an electrophile. And that electrophile can be an alkyl halide. It can be anything, really, that we've talked about. Okay, And so we can react these things with electrophiles quite easily and make these types of uh, substitutions. So, um, Reaction at the alpha carbon turns out to be uh, quite important for us. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. What about when we have a situation where we have two possible enolates that we can generate? So let's say we have something like this, where we have a hydrogen on this alpha carbon, and we have two hydrogens, and I'll just call this alpha prime, on the alpha prime carbon. In theory, I can generate two enolates, right? But I can control that. If I generate the enolate at the alpha carbon, what kind of enolate would that be? That's the thermodynamic enolate. If I generate an enolate at alpha prime, it's the kinetic. And so there are reaction conditions that allow me to form the kinetic enolate almost exclusively. And there are conditions that allow me to form the enolate at the thermodynamic position. And so today we're going to pick back up at that point about talking about the conditions that allow me to generate kinetic and thermodynamic enolates. Okay? So we learned last time, I think this is where we finished off. Is, it, is that about right? More or less? So a kinetic enolate, right, is going to be favored by these things. We need a strong non-nucleophilic base, okay? We need a polar aprotic solvent. We need low temperature, and I mean low temperature. I don't mean little ice water, okay? 
We're talking minus 78, minus 100, minus 80, really cold temperatures, okay? And so if we take this uh, unsymmetrical ketone where we have the uh, alpha prime, as I called it on the board, and my alpha carbon, right? If I drip this in to a cold solution of LDA and tetrahydrofuran, I'm going to generate as the major product the kinetic enolate. And it turns out that we can actually do that um, very selectively. It's usually greater than 90% the kinetic product. Okay, so you can get that kinetic enolate very, very easily at low temperature. Now, why is it that LDA goes after the hydrogens here as opposed to the hydrogens there? Well, there are more of them. That's true. And what else? Steric hindrance. And that has to get in with the fact that you have fewer hydrogens because you've got more substituents, right? So steric hindrance actually plays a major role in this as well. And so those are the easiest hydrogens to go after. And so that's what happens to form the kinetic product. As long as we keep it cold, we keep it in a polar aprotic solvent. Notice the solvent has to be able to dissolve all of the materials. Everything has to be in solution for this to work. And we'll talk about that again in just a moment. Okay? So LDA has a pKa range of about 40. So the equilibrium here lies completely to the right. This reaction goes very, very nicely, and we can generate the kinetic enolate. What would happen if Jack came in and generated the kinetic enolate and decided to go off to lunch and the temperature warmed up? What would he have when he gets back? He could have the thermodynamic, right? Given time to equilibrate, it will equilibrate to the more thermodynamically stable um, enolate. So he would have to be careful about that. So anytime we're doing this type of chemistry in my lab, we make sure that, you know, lunch isn't going to interfere or going home for the evening and that kind of stuff. You've got to generate the enolate and use it almost immediately. Okay? Now thermodynamic enolates can be generated um, using some different conditions. Again, we're going to need a strong base. Okay? But it doesn't have to be as strong as before, so you'll see here that they're actually using sodium uh, ethoxide here to show this, uh, and we're generating the uh, thermodynamic enolate. But notice these arrows. Those were not present in the previous one, right? So why are we showing this as an equilibrium and not completely lying to the right? So what's the pKa range of an alkoxide? Not 35. Mm -mm. What's the pKa of an alcohol? 16, right? So the pKa of the alkoxide is going to be 16. And the pKa of this hydrogen is somewhere around 20. So is that going to lie completely to the right? It is not. This base actually abstracts the most, uh, the most readily available. The kinetic always forms first, always. It has to. But the equilibrium doesn't lie to the right, and this can equilibrate. And when it equilibrates, it always equilibrates to the thermodynamic, more stable enolate. It's very important for you all to understand this. The kinetic product always forms first, always. Okay? Sometimes the kinetic and the thermodynamic can be identical, but the kinetic always forms first. Okay? So here they can get away with using a base in a protic solvent. Protic solvents favor the thermodynamic uh, enolate. And you can also um, do these reactions at room temperature. Higher temperature also favors thermodynamic. Okay? So if I want to generate the enolate at the most substituted carbon, I'm going to use these conditions. I'm going to get my enolate, and I'm going to do the chemistry at that carbon. So I can select which carbon I do chemistry at. I can do chemistry here, or I can do chemistry there, just by picking the conditions that I have. Okay? Now, let's look at an example. So let's say Anna comes into the lab, and she has that exact ketone, and 
she looks around and she finds out that we're out of LDA. We don't have any more of the amine to make the LDA with, but we have a bunch of sodium hydride. If you ever come into my lab, you'll see that we actually have about a kilogram of sodium hydride at any given moment, okay, because we use it a lot. And I think everybody will agree that sodium hydride is a strong base, right? And so she takes the sodium hydride as the base and she hopes to generate this enolate and then I don't know let's say she's going to react this so she's at low temperature so minus 78 degrees THF as the uh, solvent and then she adds something like just iodomethane and she hopes that this chemistry will occur and give her this ketone Okay, so she wants this ketone that kind of looks like somebody's jumping up and down, right? And that's what she's trying to make for the day. So she does the chemistry. She works up the product. She extracts it. She blows off the solvent. She puts a little bit in an NMR tube. And she goes to the NMR and she runs the NMR. And what she finds is that she didn't generate this product at all. <coughs> what she got instead was this. Explain why that observation is what it is. Why is it that the alkylation occurred at the most substituted carbon to give the gem dimethyl ketone? Gem meaning the same carbon. It, it was. Everything was at minus 78. I should have mentioned that. But yes, everything's cold. Is it because of the sodium hydride? It is because of the sodium hydride. And what about the sodium hydride? It's about 35 pKa. It's not as strong as LDA. Now, if she had come in and run the reaction and used LDA, she would have gotten the product she wanted. Okay, but the pKa of the starting material is about 20. 35 is substantially much larger than 20, right? So it should have been okay. But it has something to do with the sodium hydride. Ah. It is non-nucleophilic, but so is LDA. But it has to do with solubility. LDA is completely soluble in THF because it's organic. Sodium hydride, is it organic? It is not. It is a salt. Okay? And sodium salts are rarely soluble in organic solvents. Okay? And so this is not soluble. So why does that matter? Why does that matter at all? Obviously it generated not the kinetic enolate, but the thermodynamic enolate. Why does solubility make any difference at all here? You're on the right track, but it doesn't change the strength of the base. The base is still the base. It still the does change the fact that the concentration is different. That's true. Let's think a little more about it, though. It's not the leveling effect because my base isn't reacting with my solvent. Now, if I was in an alkoxide or an alcohol solvent, to, and it would generate an alkoxide then you would have a leveling effect. But THF doesn't react with the base, so there's no leveling effect here. Let's do the thought experiment. What, how would we do this thought experiment? We think about how we actually do the experiment, right? So we've got a flask. You all will have to excuse my great artistic skills, right? And we've got some solvent in there, and it's THF. It's in a big doer full of dry ice and acetone to keep it at minus 78, so everything's really nice and cold. And now Anna puts in the sodium hydride, and I'm just going to show it as little circles. It's not soluble, right? We have a biphasic mixture. Now what does she do? Everything's cold. Now what is she going to start doing? 
We've got THF, we've got the sodium hydride, it's all cold. Now what do we add? Now we're going to start to add the ketones. And we're going to add it dropwise, right? So she's going to start adding the ketone in. So what happens? What happens when that ketone hits the solution? Does it immediately react with the base? It has to find its way to the base, right? Okay? So it has to find its way to the base. And so at every moment that this reaction is occurring, it always has ketone around, even when enolate is generated. And so it allows it to equilibrate because I have the starting material and the product, and it, can, it would be allowed to equilibrate when both are present, right? Even at minus 78 degrees, that can happen. It's because it's solid, and it doesn't react instantly with the ketone is why this happens. LDA, however, is in solution. So the moment that her ketone touches the solution, it immediately reacts, and for all practical purposes, she never has this present. And so it can't equilibrate. So even though sodium hydride is a strong non-nucleophilic base, about as strong as LDA, the fact that it's not soluble means that this is a thermodynamic base. It will give you the thermodynamic product every time, okay? Because it's not in solution. So LDA, if we use the solution correctly and keep it cold, it's going to give us the... Um, kinetic product. Sodium hydride, however, will give us the what? Thermodynamic product. That's right. So very important to keep in mind exactly what's going on in the chemistry that we're discussing. Okay? And any time you can set up a situation where things can equilibrate, you're going to end up getting the thermodynamic product. Okay? So that's why you have to have your base to generate the kinetic. It has to be soluble. Everything has to be soluble. If it's not, you're going to end up generating the thermodynamic enolate. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about um, the orbitals that we see for an enolate. So here's an acetone enolate. So this was just acetone minus one of the alpha hydrogens. Uh, and when we look at the orbitals, what can we say? What's the hybridization of our enolate carbon? It's sp2, and everything's in resonance, right? We can draw resonance structures, okay? And so we have the ability to generate uh, a trigonal planar structure for our um, alpha carbon. Well, if I have a trigonal planar structure and I'm going to react that with an electrophile, will the electrophile prefer to come in from the top or the bottom? It doesn't matter. So what am I going to get for my product if I if the product would end up being uh, chiral. I'll get a racemic mixture. Okay? And so there's a lot of work on how we can actually make these enolates um, chiral. So you have some chiral group that helps direct the incoming electrophile from the top or the bottom. There's still a lot of work going on in that field. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking to you about it, but it's, it's still an area of significant research because working with these enolates actually turns out to be one of the few ways we have that's efficient at making carbon-carbon bonds, for example. Okay. So let's talk about some uh, other reactions. So one of the things that we can do with these alpha um, carbons is we can halogenate them quite easily. So for example, if you take a ketone that has at least one alpha hydrogen, you can react it in the presence of acid or base and X2, bromine or chlorine or iodine can't really use fluorine, it tends to go boom on us, right? But chlorine, bromine, and iodine work pretty well. And we can replace the hydrogen with a halogen, okay? And so we end up with these so-called alpha halo carbonyl compounds, okay? So for example, if we start off with cyclohexanone, we bubble through chlorine gas in a mixture of HCl and water, so under acidic conditions, we can actually put a single chlorine group on one of the alpha carbons. Pretty good yield, actually. The problem with this reaction is you're dealing with chlorine gas, which is not fun to work with. You'll sit there and you'll choke on it. It's not very, very fun for you, okay? Um, so is this going through an enol or an enolate? It's 
How do we know that? Okay. Under acidic conditions, we can't have an enolate, right? HCl is a strong acid. An enolate would be a strong or weak base. It's a strong base, right? And so we can't have a strong base and a strong acid present at the same time. And so this goes through an enol mechanism. So you're absolutely right. The carbonyl oxygen gets protonated, then that then tautomerizes, and you end up with the enol. The enol then reacts with the uh, chlorine, and you end up getting uh, the alpha halogenated uh, carbonyl. And this is useful stuff. Why, why, why would this be useful? What have we just done? What's the importance of what we've just done? Yeah, now we have two functional groups, right? What kind of functional group do we have now? Yeah, we have a, a halogen. And what are halogens useful for? Substitutions, right? So maybe Jack wants to react this with, oh, I don't know, maybe some kind of alkoxide and do like a Williamson ether synthesis. He can do that now. Maybe he wants to react that with cyanide and put a new carbon-carbon bond on the alpha carbon. He can do that now. He's got a leaving group, right? And so we can do this type of chemistry pretty easily, okay? The mechanism is as you would expect. It goes through uh, enolization, okay? So here's an example where uh, we're taking acetone. Bromine is actually more practical on a laboratory basis because it's a liquid uh, in acetic acid. And it turns out this is actually pretty useful for us because uh, one of our chemical suppliers actually supplies bromine and acetic acid as a, a commercially available solution, okay? And so we can just buy this and add it, and we can end up putting the bromine on the alpha carbon. The mechanism is as you would expect. The acetic acid protonates the carbonyl oxygen. It forms the enol. We don't need to spend too much time talking about that. And then the enol reacts with the bromine and puts the bromine on the alpha carbon. And of course, we then end up deprotonating the carbonyl oxygen, and we end up with HBr. Okay. So that turns out to be pretty useful. It also turns out to be pretty useful because halogens are good leaving groups, as we just mentioned. And so one of the things that we're going to talk about in the next chapter is working with these so-called alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyl compounds. Okay? They're useful for a variety of reasons. And the way that you can make them is by taking a ketone, halogenating the alpha carbon, and then eliminating HBr to put in a pi bond. And so this now is a, is a very stable molecule because of resonance, right? And we can generate these very, very easily because we've just alpha halogenated the, the uh, carbon. Okay? So take a moment, work with your partner. Solve these two problems for me. How do we convert the ketone to the alpha beta unsaturated ketone? And then on the bottom, how do we convert the alpha beta unsaturated ester into this halogenated ester? You have all the tools in your toolbox to solve these problems.
How are we going to solve the first one? Strong base and protic solvent? That might be the way that we end up going. But strong base and protic solvent by itself doesn't get us where we need to be, right? Room temperature, probably going to be part of it. How do I make the product? What do I need to make the product? We've got to think backwards, right? What do I need to make the product? What's the difference between the product and the starting material? What's the difference in the molecular formula? The difference is a double bond, which is the equivalent of what atoms? Not two carbons, but two hydrogens. There's only two hydrogens difference between the starting material and the product. Have I taught you any way to remove two hydrogens from a molecule directly to make a double bond? No. I have? No. no. <laughs> Are there ways to do that? Yes. Have we talked about it? No. Okay. But we've learned that we can make carbon-carbon double bonds by elimination of things like HBr or HCl or H2O, right? So we can eliminate H something, right? and get a carbon-carbon double bond. So if I think backwards about this, I can get that carbon-carbon double bond if I had something like that, right? I could just then react it with a base and I get the carbon-carbon double bond that I need. So I need a halogen here. It could be bromine or it can be carbon, or uh, chlorine, excuse me, but I'm gonna pick on bromine. So I'm gonna put a bromine on the most substituted carbon, which means I need to have what? Do I need an enol or an enolate here? I could do an enolate, but I'm going to go with an enol because it's easier, right? All I need is acetic acid and bromine, just like we talked about on the previous slide, right? That will give me this, and then how do I go from that to that? I just need a base that's not going to be a good nucleophile, right? And so pyridine works really well, triethylamine works, doesn't matter, and you end up getting the product by elimination of HBr across those two carbons to make the carbon-carbon double bond, okay? So that's how I'm going to do that. What about the bottom one? What's changed? The halogen's going to be there. I'm adding a halogen. I'm substituting it, replacing what? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm going to remove a hydrogen from that alpha carbon and replace it with a bromine. But wait a second. Is that alpha carbon sp3 hybridized? So are those hydrogens acidic? No because they can't be, if I pull that hydrogen off, it's never going to be in resonance delocalization with the carbonyl. So the pKa of this hydrogen right here is going to be somewhere in the 40 range. I don't remember exactly, but that's pretty high. Okay? And so not going to be able to do that by just simply removing that hydrogen and putting on a bromine. It's not going to be the same way as up here with removing the hydrogen and replacing it with a bromine through an enol. But what can I do? <clears throat> okay, that's one way to go. And I am going to have to make the hydrogen acidic. You're not on the wrong track. You're just a little premature with it. Head of the game. Ah, yes. We're going to have to add something, right? And what do I know about the starting material? What do I have that I can add something to? What functional group do I have that I can add? I've got a double bond, right? What can I add across double bonds? I can add halogens across the double bond, right? So let's look at that. So Jack comes into the lab. He takes the starting material. Okay? This is a common starting material actually used in polymer science. It's an acrylate. We can take that and we can add halogen across the double bond. We're going to pick on bromine because I need a bromine there, right? 
What's the product going to be when I add bromine across that carbon-carbon double bond? Okay, I'm going to add across this carbon-carbon double bond, right? And I'm going to get... Now, how do I remove, coming back to your original thought, I had to make that hydrogen more acidic. Is it more acidic now? Yeah. And why is it more acidic? Right, the bromine makes it more acidic, but also the hybridization has changed, right? It's now sp3 hybridized. I can generate an enolate if I wanted to, right? And so now what does Jack do? I simply react this with a non-nucleophilic base, and I do an E2 elimination, and I get the product. There you go. Very, very simple, very, very straightforward. Okay. Now, let me ask Anna this question. Why doesn't this hydrogen eliminate and that bromine and give me the bromine down here? Okay, this hydrogen is more acidic than these hydrogens, right? And so it's always the acidic hydrogen that reacts. But on paper, you could have pushed arrows that removed the hydrogen here and gave you the other product. This reaction, you can't mess this up. I swear, you can't. I mean, you take this, you add bromine until it, the red color persists. You have the bromine added across the carbon-carbon double bond, and then you throw in pyridine. And you boil it up, and you get the product. Very, very good yields. What? It's a methyl group. Yeah. <laughs> now, when we look at the halogenation of the alpha carbon, under acid, when we took chlorine and a ketone and HCl, we got a single substitution of a hydrogen for a chlorine. However, under these conditions, we end up getting both hydrogens replaced by bromine. Can you explain to me why? What's different? All right, we're under basic conditions. Under basic conditions, you typically overhalogenate the alpha carbon. Okay, it's very important to know that. Under acidic conditions, you typically stop at monohalogenation. If you let it go forever, it will actually continue to halogenate as well, but it's slower. Under basic conditions, it's hard to just replace one hydrogen with a halogen. Under basic conditions, you typically overhalogenate the alpha carbon. So why is that? Okay, that's true. So I'm not going to go through the whole mechanism in the interest of time, but the first product that we get, right, is going to be where one of the hydrogens has been replaced with a bromine. Is this hydrogen more acidic or less acidic than the starting material? It is more acidic, and why? Inductive effect, right? It is the inductive effect. Did he hurt you, Bailey? <laughs> No, don't hit him back. <laughs> don't listen to Anna. Okay. Um, so the, the product that we just generated is actually more acidic than the starting material. So what's it going to do? It's going to react with the base and generate another enolate that will react with the halogen. And so you will replace all of the hydrogens on an alpha carbon with the halogen under basic conditions. Okay? And it turns out that this is a very useful reaction to look at. So I'm going to use your domestic drinking water as an example here. All right? We're going in a different direction with this. Domestic drinking water. How do we purify domestic drinking water? Mm, you don't want metals in your drinking water, Anna. You can. You can purify it in your house with that. We add chlorine. Why do we add chlorine? 
Huh? Doesn't care about our health and still the, for the, the man doesn't care about our health? <laughs> yeah, how do you know that? It's always a man. There you go. The government. This has gone in a totally different direction than I intended. So, have you? Has anybody ever bought a Breda filter or something like that? And you, it's got a bunch of stuff in it that purifies your water. And when you read the back of it, it talks about removing chlorine, but it'll also talk about removing a compound called chloroform. C H C L three. You knock people out with it. It is a good solvent. It is also a carcinogen. <laughs> Practically all domestic drinking water that is purified with chlorine will contain traces of chloroform. The question is why? It's because the reason we add chloroform is to kill microbes. And microbes are organic species, or th living things, right? They're organic. The chlorine actually reacts with them to kill them, right? And one of the byproducts is chloroform. So by cleaning up your water, by keeping you from getting dysentery, we end up putting a little bit of chloroform in your water. It's not because there's some company down the river dumping chloroform into your drinking water. Okay? It turns out your odds of getting cancer from chloroform are a lot less than you dying from dysentery if we don't treat your, your uh, drinking water with, with chlorine. You've got to get rid of the microbes because they'll do all kinds of havoc on you. Okay? And so that's why they always test for how well these filters can remove things like chloroform. It's not because there's companies dumping chloroform in the water anymore. It's because the cleaning process does this. And this actually happens because these little microbes okay, have these little molecules. We don't care what's here, but they quite frequently have these methyl carbonyl type groups in some of their membranes. Okay? Now, when we react this with chlorine, Usually your drinking water is slightly basic. It's not exactly neutral. So I'm just going to put OH minus here. But it, it's not extremely basic. It's slightly basic. And so what can happen is the alpha hydrogens are going to get replaced with what? Chlorines. So you're going to have CCl3. But that's not chloroform yet, is it? What can happen? Not tautomerization. I've got the C and the CL3s now, right? What am I missing? I'm missing the hydrogen. But I'm under basic conditions, right? So what can happen is that hydroxide can attack the carbonyl. Now what happens? Huh? Well, if the proton transfer, it, it can happen, it will happen, but it doesn't get us any worse. Right We're trying to get to that right there. Okay. There's no oxygen in chloroform, but I didn't show everything. Chloroform, that's everything for chloroform. What do I got to do? Okay. How am I going to do that? Are you sure? It's, it's a good leaving group. Why is it an excellent leaving group, Anna? The oxygen? No. The CCL3. Uh huh. That's exactly right. I've got three chlorines that are electronegative. This anion is actually quite stable. And now this is an acidic hydrogen, right? It just picks up that hydrogen and you make chloroform. Uh, so we don't remove the oxygen, we remove the CCL3. We remove the CCL3. This is called the haliform reaction. Okay, haliform reaction. It's very famous. It is why your Brita filters talk about being able to remove chlorinated species like chloroform, because you're going to get it by the very virtue that we're trying to kill those microbes in that lake water that you all drink by adding trace amounts of chlorine. Okay? You can take your chances, okay? And it, I'm not trying to, f your chances of getting cancer from the core form, it's so low that it's essentially practically zero, okay? Well, maybe that's because of gas. What's a gas? Chlorine. Chlorine. So if you ever go to a 
Uh, I've been to several water treatment plants. They actually have big tanks of chlorine gas, and they bubble it through the water as it's going through, uh, going through this system. Huh? Why did you go into the water so when I was an undergraduate, I paid my way through school by working at an environmental lab. And so I spent my Saturdays going to places, picking up samples and bringing them back and analyzing them. And some places were water treatment plants. So um, it was fun, except it was on Saturdays. You, but that's okay. There is another reaction that you need to know. It's still the haliform reaction, but instead of using chlorine, it uses iodine. Okay, so if you have a ketone that has a methyl group, so it has to be at least a methyl ketone, so something like acetophenone, and you use iodine and hydroxide, this is a test for methyl ketones. This is how back in the day, before we had NMR, way back in the day, okay, because NMR's been around since the 50s. So way back when, if they wanted to know if they'd made a methyl ketone, they did what's called the iodoform test. And so this would end up making a carboxylate plus iodoform. And it turns out that iodoform is a solid that is yellow. And so when you run this test, you would get a precipitate of this yellow material that would be a positive indicator for a methyl ketone. Okay? There is something else that's important about this reaction that you all need to know. What is it? I can make what? I can make carboxylic acids. I can take methyl ketones and I can make carboxylic acids. And I can make these methyl ketones like this from what kind of reaction did we learn about making these types of bonds? Friedel Crafts acylation. So I can take aromatic rings, do Friedel Crafts acylation, and convert those acyl groups into carboxylic acids. How else do we know to make carboxylic acids? Ozonolysis. How else? CO2 in Grignards. How else? Potassium permanganate and methyl benzenes or alkyl benzenes, right? How else? Acid chlorides in water. How else? There's so many ways. Think of some more. How about oxidation of alcohols? What alcohol? Primary. Primary. And what's the oxidizing agent? Jones reagents. You all now have a whole bunch of ways to make carboxylic acids. Okay? And that's a good thing. Because you need different ways to make these functional groups depending on the complexity of your molecule. So we're going to pick back up on that. We're a little bit behind. Um, I'm going to continue on chapter 18 because we don't have an inverted for chapter 18. We're 18 and 19 are combined. But I do have, just wait, I have stuff to hand back. So.